There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat food, eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. I've never felt the need before on a sermon to start off with a trigger warning. This may be simply because the society we're living in seems to tell us that we have the right neither to be upset by anything that we hear or read or see. Although, to be honest, those making the news often seem to be more bothered about protecting us from flashing images than from suffering, exploitation, persecution or sexualization. Yeah, it might be just a reflection of our society today, but the trigger warning also reflects the fact that I haven't preached directly on the judgment of God before. But this series on difficult questions that Christians get asked give me, gives me the opportunity to do just that. So, here's the trigger warning. You might find some of what I have to say to you this morning upsetting or unsettling. In fact, I hope you will find what I have to say to you this morning unsettling and upsetting. You see, Christ never pretended that his message was not radical, countercultural, controversial, or divisive. He never pretended that his message was comfortable, easy listening. Remember that it was his teaching that both upset the Jewish and the Roman authorities to the point that he was arrested, tried, and killed, despite being a completely innocent man. Oh, by the way, I'm not suggesting that that's in any way appropriate response to your preacher this morning. I'm just the messenger of God's word. So, you see, the question I've been given for today is how can a loving God judge us? As a church, we've definitely focused more on the loving aspects of God's character than on his judgment. But, spoiler alert, God is a judging God. He will judge every single one of us. And that judgment will have eternal implications for every single person that inhabits this planet of ours, whether they believe in him or not. And that judgment and those implications are unsettling and upsetting, to say the least. So, I think we'd better pray. Father God, we want to hear your words this morning. Words of truth and life. 
and simply not words that make us feel better. We want to know your heart and your message, that we might be prepared and equipped to do our part, to be your hands, your feet, your voice to those in our world that need to know you. Holy Spirit, come open our ears, our minds and our hearts, we pray. Amen. So let me break this main question down into smaller questions and we can tackle each one of these one by one using the Bible as our guide. So let's think about will God, God sit in judgment? Over whom? And when will that happen? Then we'll think about what we will be judged for. What criteria will be used? And then what are the possible outcomes of that judgment? Then our question, how can a loving God also be a judging God? And then we'll think about, so what? What are the implications of what we hear? So, our first question, will God sit in judgment? Over whom and when? Who will he judge and when will it happen? Let me say, this is an area in which there has been much speculation and indeed, in my view, many falsities written and preached. I've already told you in the spoiler alert that God will sit in judgment and he will judge every person that has ever, is currently and ever will walk this earth. How can I be so confident in that? Well, the Bible tells us clearly that this is the case. Let's have a look at just a few of those verses. So Psalm 96, 13 says this, Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and his peoples in faithfulness. Isaiah 3 and verse 13, The Lord takes his place in court and he rises to judge the people. And Ezekiel 34, 20. This is what the sovereign Lord says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Now, we'll come back to sheep sorting shortly. But the Old Testament is brimming over. Almost every page are with warnings of God's judgment, both for Jews and for Gentiles. But so is the New Testament. Let's have a quick look at a couple of those verses. Romans 2 verse 16. This will take place on the day God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Or 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things we've done while in the body, whether good or bad. Yes, God will sit in judgment. It's in here, on almost every page as we read it. But notice in that 2 Corinthians 5 passage, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All, that is, everyone. God's gift of free will to us doesn't extend to his judgment. We have no choice. All will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But when will this happen? Well, let me read three verses from Matthew's Gospel, which I could have easily chosen for my reading this morning. Matthew uh, 24 and 25 both speak of what will happen in the end times when Jesus returns to earth in his glory. Verse 31 says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as, <coughs> as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on on his left. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. So the judgment will follow 
Jesus' return to the earth. The date of which we're told in Matthew 24, not even Jesus knows, but only the Father. But beware. Jesus followed that with a couple of parables about being ready. His return could be at any time. Are we ready? Now, there has been a huge amount of discussion about the details of this judgment, and in particular, what order will be judged in, and exactly when and how things will, will operate there. I don't intend to spend my precious time this morning discussing the plethora of writings of academic theologians. I just want to say for certain, we will be judged, living or dead, when Jesus comes again. So be warned. Let's move on. What will we be judged for? This one is easier to answer. In writing to the church in Rome, Paul wrote this. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. He's there quoting Isaiah 45 and speaking about all facing judgment again. And then it goes on. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. An account of ourselves. An account of our lives. Before the judgment seat of God, we will need to account for every element of our lives. What we've done with our lives. Each decision that we've made. Every action, every word, even every thought. How we've used every minute that God has granted to us every possession that he's lent us, and every relationship that he's formed in us. That's a very thorough examination. And what will criteria will be used? Well, it's simple. Are we up to God's standard? And God's standard is perfection. So God will ask each and every one of us this. Did you use every second of every day of your life perfectly. In other words, he'll ask, did you sin? I did warn you that this was going to get uncomfortable. Because although I don't sit in judgment in any way over you, I do know the answer to that question. Because it's the same for every single person throughout time. Well, with one exception. As Paul wrote, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let's move on to our next question. What are the possible outcomes of that judgment? Let me take you back to that passage in Matthew's Gospel that I said could have been our text this morning. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So those who are placed on his right are those who pass the judgment, and they get to go to the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's the kingdom of God which we commonly know as heaven. Now Peter painted a picture of heaven for us a few weeks back, but let me read something for you from this book here. Written back in the 17th century, it describes a vision that the author of Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, had concerning heaven and hell. Now, we need to weigh revelations against God's wrath, against God's word, the Bible. But over the last 350 years, this volume has been weighed by many, the majority of whom have found it completely compatible with Scripture. And it provides a detailed description of some vision of heaven, which Bunyan claims was given to him by God. Firstly, a little preamble. I found myself transferred into heaven. 
where I saw things that are impossible to describe and heard beautiful songs that I could never sing. Whoever has not seen that glory can speak but very imperfectly of it. And those who have seen it cannot tell the thousandth part of what it is. So we can read just a thousandth of what Bunyan saw. But let me read some of his description of heaven to you. The language is a little antiquated, but I hope you will follow. When I first was brought near this glorious place, I saw innumerable hosts of bright attendants who welcomed me into this blessed place of happiness. And there I saw that perfect, unapproachable light which changes all things into its own nature. For even the souls of the glorified saints are transparent. They're not illuminated by the sun, but all that light that flows with such transparent brightness through these heavenly mansions is nothing else but the shining forth of the divine glory. Compared to this glory, the light of the sun is but darkness, and the fire of the most sparkling jewels are but dead coals. Therefore it is called the throne of the glory of God, where the radiance of divine majesty is revealed in the most illustrious manner. God was too bright for me to look upon as he was exalted on the throne of his glory, while multitudes of angels and saints sang forth eternal alleluias and praises to him. Well, may he be called the God of glory, but for by his presence he makes heaven what it is. Rivers of pleasure continually spring forth from the divine presence and radiate cheerfulness, joy and splendour to all the blessed inhabitants of heaven, the seat of his eternal empire. For my part, I was too weak to bear the least ray of glory which shone from that everlasting spring of light which sat upon the throne. I was forced to cry out to my conductor, the sight of so much glory is too great for me to bear, yet it is so refreshing and delightful that I would desire to look, though I die. No, no, said my conductor, death cannot enter this blessed place, nor sin, nor sorrow can abide. It is the glory of this happy place to be forever freed from all that is evil. And without that freedom, our blessedness even here would be imperfect. I'm not sure my small mind can picture that place, but it sounds incredible. But let's consider the alternative. Let me take you back to our passage in Matthew 25. He put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Jesus went on to say, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire for devils, prepared for the devils and his angels. Now it's certainly not comfortable to preach on hell. Many will tell you the comfort that hell doesn't exist. Others will describe it perhaps as a place similar to life on earth, but with maybe a little more darkness. But that doesn't really fit what we read in the Bible. The Bible speaks of hell frequently. Jesus describes hell many times, each description slightly different, including these. Matthew 8. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13. The angels will come round and separate the wicked from the righteous, that's the judgment, and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible goes on in Revelation. But the cowardly the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, immoral, those who practice magic, sorry, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, in other words, all those that fail God's judgment, 
they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulphur. Let me read again from Bunyan's vision. This time as he speaks of God's revelation to him of hell. In this dark, sad place of misery and sorrow, we have lost the wondrous presence of the ever-blessed God. This is what this makes, makes this dungeon hell. Though we had lost a thousand worlds, it would not be as important to us as this one great loss. Could we but see the least glimpse of his favour here, we might be happy. But we have lost it to our everlasting woe. Here we have also lost the company of all the saints and angels, but instead have nothing but tormenting devils. Here we have lost heaven too, the centre of blessedness. There is a deep gulf between us and heaven, so that we are shut out from it forever. Those everlasting gates that let the redeemed into heaven are now shut forever against us. To make our wretchedness far worse, we have lost the hope of ever obtaining a better condition. This makes us truly hopeless. Well, may our hearts now break, since we are both without hope and help. And we are also tormented by suffering pain, as I will now try and explain to you. First, we undergo a variety of torments. We are tormented here by a thousand, no, 10,000 different ways. Those who suffer upon the earth seldom have more than one affliction at a time. But if they had ulcers, gallstones, headache, and fever at the same time, would they not be very miserable? Yet all those together are but, but like the biting of a flea compared to those intolerable sharp pains which we endure. Here we have all the sufferings of hell. Here is an unquenchable fire which burns us, a lake of burning brimstone which ever chokes us, and eternal change which, chains which bind us. Here there is utter darkness to frighten us, and a worm of conscience which gnaws upon us everlastingly. Any one of these is worse to bear than all the torments that mankind ever felt on earth. But our torments are not only various, but also universal. They afflict every part of the body and torment all the powers of the soul. This makes what we suffer the worst of tortures. In those sicknesses which men had on earth, some parts of their body will suffer, yet other parts will have no pain. Here it is different. Every part of the soul and the body suffers at the same time. Our eyes are tormented here with the sight of devils who appear in all the horrible and black appearances that sin can give them. Our ears are continually tormented with the loud, continual yelling of the damned. Our nostrils are smothered with sulfurous flames, our tongues with burning blisters, and the whole body is rolled in flames of liquid fire. All the powers and the faculties of, so of our souls are also tormented here. The imagination suffers with the thoughts of our present pain and the memory of heaven we have lost. Our minds are tormented as we remember how foolishly we spent our precious time on earth. Our understanding is tormented with the thoughts of past pleasures, present pains and future sorrows which are to last forever. And our consciences are tormented with a continually gnawing worm. Although Bunyan goes on to describe six further torments, to uh, torments I'm going to save you from them this morning. And just like the description of heaven, we're told that we have only a thousandth, a tiny inkling into the reality of hell. Friends, I want to impress on you that hell is real is eternal and is for all those who fail God's judgment. They will spend eternity there. So where is the hope? Aren't we all condemned to spend eternity in hell? Well, no, because Jesus is the only person 
that lived that perfect life. The only person that passes God's judgment test. And his offer to us is simple. Would you like me to take your place in front of God when it comes to judgment? The implications are simple. It's a get out of jail card. A free pass to heaven. That's our gospel message. That's the good news. That's the offer. A free pass to heaven. So let's come back to that original question. How can a loving God also be a judging one? How can God be both love and judge? Well, the answer is that he's not just love and judge. But he is the way, the truth and the life. He's provided our way to heaven, the only way. He's provided the truth about judgment, the reality of heaven and hell. And he's given us the keys to eternal life with him in the kingdom of God. God's judgment is a direct result of man's sinfulness. God cannot let sin into heaven. He cannot have sin in his presence. And hence, judgment is his only option. But through his love, he provides a solution to sin. The only way by which sin can be removed from us, the way that cost him his very life on that cross. So let me come back now to Lazarus and to our reading today. Jesus took a common Hebrew folktale describing the reversal of fortunes after death, that God would make things fair by reversing the fortunes from this life into the next. Many today would call it karma. I know my gran would have described it as people getting their just desserts, getting what's coming to them. But Jesus turned this traditional folktale into a picture of heaven and hell. Lazarus is in heaven. Despite having suffered terribly, he's accepted Jesus' free gift. He sees the rich man, who is unnamed in this account, suffering in agony and asks him, no, the Greek's much stronger than that. He desperately begs him to relieve the unquenchable heat with just a drop of water. Abraham, who is standing with Lazarus, refuses. Once the judgment has been made, it's too late. There's no path which crosses the chasm between heaven and hell. Well, the rich man says, begs, at least some send someone back from the dead to warn my brothers, which of course is exactly what God did. The question is, will we believe that man who came back from the dead? You see, the very purpose of life is revealed to us here. Will we believe the man who came back from the dead? The only man who has been to hell and returned to offer us not only a warning about hell, but also the way to escape it. A way to heaven. Will you accept, the, accept Jesus' offer to take your place in front of the judgment seat of God? And will you accept it before it's too late? I want to make two further points this morning. Firstly, I want to say that God is the judge, not us. He will decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, who passes his judgment and who does not. We know for certain that those who accepted Jesus into their life have a free pass to heaven. The Bible tells us that very clearly. But those that haven't, we have to leave to God. He examines each and every heart. We might question, what happens to babies that are stillborn or die very young? What about Auntie Flo who has Alzheimer's? Or Uncle Bob who didn't darken the doors of a church building during the three score years and ten? Those people and many, many, many more 
we have to leave in God's hands. We know they will face judgment, but we don't know their hearts. The Bible warns us time and time and time again against judging others. Judging is God's role, not ours. We just have to learn to leave them in God's hands. I know that's unsettling and upsetting. But we can't start to take on God's role. And then my final point is this. We do know that those who have accepted Jesus into their life have a free pass to heaven and will pass through God's judgment. John Bunyan's vision of inexpressible riches of heaven and untold sufferings of hell spurred him on to spend every moment of his life telling people about Jesus. But it's not just John Bunyan. Many evangelists will tell you that a revelation of the truth of heaven and hell and the incredible love that, Je that led Jesus to die on the cross, that we might gain heaven and be saved from hell, is their prime motivation to share the gospel with anyone who will listen, and often with many that won't. Jesus told us that the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few and urged us to ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into the harvest field. No, we're not all called to be evangelists but we are all called to be his witnesses, his hands, his feet, his voice, his workers who speak to others about the good news of Jesus Christ. My prayer for each of us this morning is that the truth of God's judgment and the reality of both heaven and hell might unsettle each one of us and spur us on to pray for and speak to those who we meet who have not yet accepted Jesus' free pass. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for revealing to us the reality of heaven and hell. The reality of God's judgment with us. Not only that, but the way to pass that judgment. The truth in a world of lies and the life eternally with you. Father, fill us up with your Holy Spirit, we pray, that we might shine as your lights to our families, our schools and workplaces, our community, our city, our nation. The light of your gospel message, your good news, your free gift of eternity with you and escape from the torments of hell. Lord, we feel ill-equipped and afraid, but we know you will accomplish things through us. So give us the courage and give us the words of eternal life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.